Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Descent Part 2, released in 2009. This is a pretty standard horror movie sequel in a whole bunch of ways, starting with the fact that it's not really necessary. The first Descent film, like I've said, is one of my all-time favorite horror movies, and I don't think it really called for a continuation of the story. But when has that ever stopped a sequel from getting made? The Descent Part 2 picks up immediately after the first film's conclusion, somewhat negating the original downer UK ending, since it finds Sarah, played again by Shauna McDonald, having successfully escaped the cannibalistic crawler cave. Before you can say contrived, she's back in the caves again as part of a rescue mission looking for the other girls. Add in some claustrophobia and a bunch of creepy crawlers, and you've got yourself a recipe for leftovers that aren't quite as good as the original meal. How many kills will we find in these caves as we go back underground for seconds? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins, once again, in the Appalachian Mountains, USA. Same place as before, featuring the same sweeping score. A dusty, dirty dude driving a service vehicle narrowly avoids a green screen deer in the road, but he doesn't avoid the bloodied up Sarah banging on his window. Nor does he avoid this title car. Don't descend too deep down now, y'all. It's two days after Sarah and her friends went missing, and while there are search teams out looking for them, namely cave expert Dan and his flirtatious underlings Greg and Calf, they're looking in the wrong cave system, since Juno pulled that old cavern switcheroo. Sarah awakens in a hospital bed, to a couple of cops questioning her. The sympathetic Deputy Rios and the less sympathetic sheriff of these here mountains, a guy named Baines. So that's where Chuck Cunningham ran off to. Okay. Sarah's not much used to them, though, because she doesn't remember anything from two days ago. Or, apparently, from even a year ago? Where's Jesse? Your daughter? Oh, not something you want to have to learn a second time. A canine good boy tracks Sarah's smell to an old mine shaft. So the spelunking experts head there as Baines grows suspicious of Sarah after learning about the blood on her clothes. Turns out the blood is A positive, which is not her blood type, but is the blood type of the still missing Juno. So, I'm A positive. Half the state is A-positive. Yeah, like me! I'm A-positive too! It's easy to remember, because I'm an A-plus guy. Vane's suspicions are not assuaged, though, so he takes Sarah along with them as they, too, go to the old mine. That old dusty feller, Ed Oswald, tells the cops and cavers that there's an unexplored cave system at the bottom of this mine shaft, one that his granddaddy went into once upon a time and never came out of. He then suggests they take the old elevator down, even though Greg isn't confident in the equipment's integrity. So Honey, let me tell you, this old shit bucket will be working long time after that MP3 of yours. It'll work long after a digital file format will work? What? Maybe he just prefers the uncompressed wave format. Or maybe he's an analog guy, who knows? Believing that Sarah could help them navigate the caves, Baines orders the obviously troubled woman to accompany them underground. So after everyone gears up, they hop into old man analog's rickety ass elevator as he gives them a wink goodbye. Or maybe that was just an eye twitch? I don't know, kinda shady though. Despite some creepy and squeaking, the elevator gets them down the shaft in one piece, which was actually done in a pretty fun way on set. They used a rolling rubber rock wall that scrolled upwards on a belt behind the actors, causing a believable simulation of their elevator's descent. Way easier than filming on an actual mineshaft elevator. Once down there, they begin to traverse the tunnels, making record time thanks to a bunch of handy dissolves. A similar series of dissolves was also used in the original film, which was edited by this movie's director director, John Harris. The Descent Part 2 is Harris's one and only directing credit, but the dude is a very accomplished editor, even earning an Oscar nomination for his work on 127 Hours. A little ways in, they come across the skull of a, wait, a dinosaur? Oh, no, it's not actually that big, but it is still kind of scary, especially coupled with that warning sign they blatantly ignore to go deeper into the earth. Prompted by Rio, Sarah looks around for anything that might help jog her memory. <laughs> Yeah, like that. Only, turns out, that's just a calcium deposit. Damn, cave, brush your teeth more often. Cap uses a device to listen deeper into the cave, and some dolphin-sounding clicking noises triggers a night vision flashback for Sarah. Need any more reminders of what happened down here, Sarah? How about the eviscerated body of Rebecca, whose tum-tum got nom-nommed by a crawler in the first movie? Wait, is she moving? Was I wrong to put Rebecca on the count? Oh, nope, it's just Ratty the Rat. Ain't he a stinker? Vane's accuses Sarah 
Sarah of being responsible for Rebecca's death, but a couple more flashbacks get her to finally speak up and say that they were all attacked by something in these caves. Vane's doesn't believe her though, and she only earns more suspicion when her most intense set of flashbacks yet leads her to kick Vane's in the face and fight her way free of the rest of the group. Vane's heads after Sarah on his own as the others regroup, with Kath checking on Greg's injuries. How's it feel? You wanna kiss it better? He's fine. Aw, Cap, he's just trying to be your Prince Charming. While the Cavers and Rios evaluate the precarious rocks ahead of them, Baines uses another electronic device to search for Sarah in the dark. His gunfire causes a cave collapse that covers him and the spelunking team in rocks, and after the stone and sediment has settled, Kath finds herself completely trapped and isolated from everyone else. Kath's unfortunate circumstances here are one of the best times this movie evokes the same claustrophobic terror that made the first movie so memorable, especially as Dan grows desperate and despondent over how helpless it is. Realizing there's nothing they can do for her right now, the others leave to look for help, promising her they'll come back later. Nothing like a good cave and cry, huh, Calf? Dan, Greg, and Rios find an area of the cave filled with the carcasses of dead animals and mid-2000s technology. As Sarah hides behind a rock and listens, they watch the camcorder footage, which shows the then-still-alive spelunking girls before they all went out and got murdered. It also shows what murdered them. <laughs> What the fuck is what? Oh, that! That's a cave crawler, dude. They'll eat you up. They separate as they flee, and Rios almost gets herself killed by calling out for the others. But thankfully, Sarah appears to be Rios' personal crawler guy. Sarah can't help Dan, though, who never gets the message about shutting the fuck up. A crawler attacks him, and then just mauls the hell out of his neck, all while Sarah and Rios watch silently. Dan's corpse is dragged away, but not before Sarah's able to silently grab his equipment bag without the crawler ever hearing her. Stealth 100, motherfuckers! Kath tries to make the best of her situation, but it's kinda hard to do that when you've got goop dripping down on your hand. Careful there, Kath. We've all seen there's something about Mary. But who could be responsible for that cave hair gel? <laughs> Of fucking course. Kath takes off her caving gear so she can squeeze her way to safety, and to make sure she won't be followed by this blind bastard, she kicks out a rock to crush his head. Kath ends up finding Greg, and because the buddy system is always the way to go, they become cave partners. Meanwhile, Sarah catches up her cave partner with creepy crawler factoids, like how they can't see, but they can hear real good. Aw, but hey, doesn't Sheriff Baines get a cave partner? Sure he does. Dan's corpse. Have fun, you two. Continuing our tour of Descent 1's victims, Cap and Greg find Sam's body hanging right where the crawlers left it. With the sound of screeching monsters behind them, they decide that the best course of action is to use that body to get across. During the bloody swing around, a male crawler attacks Greg and a female one hops onto Cap. Greg gets his neck bitten out, but not to be outdone by this subterranean sum of bitch, he takes out a power drill and puts down his attacker with it. Nothing like a good drill kill. Greg then elects to save his crush Cap by recklessly jumping onto the female crawler and falling down the chasm with her. And although we'll see later that Greg survived this fall, spoiler alert, we'll see no such indication for the female crawler, so she goes on the list. Finally free to swing in peace, Cap gets across the chasm and has to face the fact that she's lost her cave partner down a hole. But don't worry, Cap, he won't be lonely for long, cause here's a new friend. Oh, turns out he's, he's not very friendly, is he? But he is pretty damn good at shadow puppets. With the extraneous characters killed off, Sarah and Rios continue onward and swim through a flooded tight tunnel. This is another nice variation on the Descent's claustrophobic terror. I mean, Rios be looking like she's on Fear Factor right now. Rios begins to feel a little hopeless, so she takes a breather and films a goodbye video for her daughter to find. Ooh, look at who's got a kid who's still alive. Way to rub it in, Rios. The poignancy of the situation actually reinvigorates Sarah. Everything you just said, you tell it to her face. We're not dead yet. And the cave partners carry on. Sheriff Baines is flying solo at this point, or er, cave in solo, I guess, and he ain't interested in any crawlers as cave partners, partner. He's nearly killed by the seeker creature until a climbing pick up and pops out of its mouth. Another stab to the head puts down the first crawler for good, and a second is also quickly dispatched of by Baines's newest cave partner, one who's finally not a corpse or a crawler. It's the numero uno crawler killer, Juno. Sarah and Rios crawl through a tight 
light tunnel and are forced by a crawler to drop down into another cave pool. After a cave cannonball, the crawler comes close to killing Sarah before Rios comes to the rescue with a hairpin of some sort, which she uses to stab the creature in the neck with. Good work, Rios. You never forget your first crawler kill. Too bad they can't really celebrate this victory, since it turns out the water they're standing in is less of a swimming pool and more of a cesspool. The giant cave toilet bowl for these nasty little fuckers to poop in. This gross septage tank, which reminds me of Tandy's swimming pool in Last Man on Earth, was filled with gelatin and all sorts of gross stuff, and actors Shauna McDonald and Kristen Cummings had to spend three days shooting in this so-called shit pit. It was kind of funny for about an hour. <laughs> now, Juno may not be covered in poop, but she's still looking a little feral by this point. Still, she picks right back up on her cave guide duties as she leads veins past potential death all around them. And in case you forgot why Juno was left behind when Sarah managed to break free, we get a lengthy reminder during a recap combo between Rios and Sarah. So I hurt her so I could get away. Yeah, that's gonna make this reunion pretty awkward, huh? Juno very nearly kills Sarah before Rios tells her to stop, fibbing that Sarah brought them back down here to rescue Juno voluntarily. With a tense peace established, Juno says she can lead them out of the cave now that she's not all alone in the dark. And, you know, as long as nobody else puts another pig through her leg. Sarah tries to go her own way, but Vane's handcuffs her to him, so she's forced to join the cops as they follow her limping ex-friend. Vane's refuses to uncuff her as they cry across a rickety rock bridge, and that proves to be a problem when it gives out underneath him, threatening to pull both of them down the chasm. Juno, help me please, Juno! Whoa, pretty rich to say that after the shit you pulled back in the original, Sarah. They try to pull Veins up over the edge, but with crawlers creeping up on him, they realize there's no other choice than to cut Sarah free from him by severing his arm at the wrist. Rios finally picks through all of Veins' wrists, and he falls into the chasm alongside two cave crawlers, giving us three Three more victims to add to the count. Juno leads the ladies to the cave exit, but it's blocked by a bunch of blind bastards. At first, the women are able to narrowly sneak by, but that ends when a still-living Greg grabs Juno's arm and causes her to scream. And then he dies. Wow, way to die a narc, Greg. There's another giant rumble in the tunnel, during which Sarah and Rios manage to kill their sparring partners with the handcuffs and a rock, respectively. Juno's having trouble with her extra-sized crawler, though, so Rios says, that she and Sarah should just get the heck out of there. Not willing to leave Juno behind for a second time, Sarah instead turns back and uses her handcuff to drag the crawler away from Juno. The crawler still manages to tear open Juno's stomach though, spelling inevitable death for the surprise survivor. But before she goes out, Juno helps Sarah kill the creature by ripping out its neck with her teeth. Oh, and then Sarah stabs it too. Teamwork! Unfortunately, Juno then dies in Sarah's arms right afterward, leaving Sarah pretty somber thanks to their last minute reconciliation. Just try to focus on how she slept with your late husband, Sarah. It might make this whole thing a lot easier for you. Rios goes to leave, only to get stopped by a bunch of crawlers in her way. So Sarah decides to pull a real John Krasinski for the sake of Rios' survival. We watch the crawlers swarm her, and although we don't see her killed, and Juno survives some similar circumstances in the original, since there's no additional sequel to show that she survived, I'm gonna count Sarah as dead here. Rios makes her getaway in shots that are pretty much an exact fucking copy of the ones from the original. This callback is just a bit too carbon copy for my liking. Feels less like a nod and more like just a lazy lift. In any case, she escapes above ground and runs through the forest to freedom. But when she goes to call someone for an evac, she gets surprised by a shovel to the face, courtesy of that weird Ed Oswald dude. What the heck, guy? He drags her to a hole and leaves her there, content to end this movie with a sacrifice and a jump scare. How many people and or crawlers got killed when they weren't too busy pooping in pools? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, going underground. There were 17 deaths in The Descent Part 2, two more than in the first film. The victims consisted of three human men, three human women, ten crawler men, and one crawler woman. 
giving us yet another creepy crawling quad wedge pie chart. With a run time of 94 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 5.53 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the first crawler death in the movie, the one Kath kills with a skull crush. Dull Machete for lamest kill will go to the crawlers who fell down the chasm with Cher Fanes. He's not included, because of the whole arm thing, but those crawlers just fell into darkness. Boring. And that's it. The Descent Part 2 came out in 2009, and while it's nothing special, it wasn't quite as bad as I thought it would be based on its reputation. It's just kinda, you know, whatever. Friday's our first kill count of October this year, which means it's time to satisfy our sweet tooth and visit the Candyman! But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this kill count. I want to thank a ton of patrons like Linda from Accounting, Joseph B. Colson III, Brad Sturgis, Ryan Clark, Daniel Grinke, Nicole Whitney, Jason Sloan, Isaac Kay, and Ashley Sanderson. Thank you so much, you and all the other amazing patrons. So excited to get to Candyman! Thanks everyone, be good people.